Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Pastor Kurt Skelly is a person that I first met several years ago, and we were both speaking at a pastor's conference in Michigan. I'd heard about Pastor Skelly, but never had the privilege to meet him. Met him there, and then not long after, had the opportunity to do two different trips with Pastor Skelly to Israel. Wonderful um, opportunity not only to see the, the place that we call the Holy Land, but an opportunity to get to know somebody who has a passionate love for the Lord and a passionate love for his people. Every time, I don't always say this, but every time I have had the privilege to hear Pastor Skelly preach, he has always been not only a blessing to me, but a help to me. I'm so grateful for the way he looks into the word, opens it, and then explains it in ways that meet me right where I am. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter number one. And I'm going to read a couple of verses for us just to get us started, and then we'll jump right into, I think, an important message for this hour uh, certainly an important message for me, and I'm hoping an important message in your life as well. So Nehemiah chapter 1, and look if you would at verse 1. So Nehemiah chapter 1, and look at verse 1, where the Bible says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Kislu, or Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. If I were to say the name Nehemiah to you this morning, I think that most of you that have any level of Bible literacy would say, well, Nehemiah, he's the one that built the wall. And, and you would be right. Nehemiah certainly is known as the one that rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. Not that he built the wall, he rebuilt the wall. It was broken, it was in disrepair. I mean, the very verse we read a moment ago says that. But, but I think that if we were to label Nehemiah as the wall builder alone, we would be doing Nehemiah a tremendous disservice. I believe that if Nehemiah were here this morning and were able to talk to us, I don't think that the topic of his conversation would be the wall. And while he's known as the builder of the wall, and while the book of Nehemiah is known as a book of leadership, and people have done Bible studies and talked about leadership principles in the book of Nehemiah, how a leader gets the job done, and the organizational principles, all that goes into it, and while, while all of that might be true, and it is, that that really was not the heartbeat of Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't a, a wall builder. He wasn't somebody trained in wall building. He wasn't somebody that had a passion for walls. 
And while that was a project that Nehemiah was called of God to oversee, it was a project that was relatively, relatively insignificant in Nehemiah's life. The, the building of the wall took 52 days. But Nehemiah's burden for, Nehemiah's passion for, Nehemiah's call to the people of God was a lifetime. And so let's not minimize the call upon Nehemiah, the burden that Nehemiah had by just talking about the wall that Nehemiah built. As a matter of fact, this morning, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes on this topic. The, the birth of a burden, the, the birth of a burden. I, I think in many respects, we, we live in a, a, in a pampered age of Christianity. I, I say that not to be negative. I say that as an observation, certainly in American Christianity, we are of all people most blessed. I mean, just look around at the freedoms that we enjoy and on a day like today, think about the, the prosperity that is ours. And we might lament this or that. We might talk about this issue or that issue or a disagreement with this policy or that policy. But can we just look at the big picture this morning and understand that we have a great blessing to be in this country. We have a great blessing uh, to uh, be in this, uh, this age of Christianity. In, in so many respects, we live cushy, cozy, and comfortable lives. If you were to look up your salary by world standards, no matter who you are in this room or watching on live stream, what you would find is that you are in the upper echelon of uh, world income. We, we are of all people most blessed. We really are. When it comes to physical prosperities, we are so blessed. And yet I, I'm afraid that sometimes the blessings that we enjoy and the places that we live and uh, the, the kinds of things that are ours so in, in some cases have, have almost been a, a cloud over our eyes to see the bigger issues to which God has called us to uh, discover the bigger burden, I think, uh, to which God is calling us, uh, uh, a bigger vision that God wants us to see. I think sometimes the, the, the prosperities that we enjoy can all, uh, uh, almost be a barrier to what God wants us to accomplish in our lives. Uh, Paul talked about that. He said the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But, but thou, O man of God, he said to Timothy, flee these things and follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and, and patience and meekness and fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Timothy, uh, live for eternal things. Timothy, lift up your eyes. Was that not the language of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 4? When he said, lift up your eyes and, and look on the fields. Are they not white already unto harvest? You're thinking about physical things and your life is clouded with what you have and what you see. But I, I want to lift you up and uh, help you to see something that's far more important, far more eternal. Uh, Nehemiah is a great Old Testament example of that kind of vision, of that kind of burden. Where did that burden come from? What, what was it that was festering in Nehemiah's heart and life that, that made him have just this heart for uh, the reputation of Almighty God, that this heart for a group of hurting people, this heart for uh, to do something with his life that would matter for all of eternity? Where was the burden born? Nehemiah chapter 1 is such an instructive passage when it comes to that exact question. The birth of a burden. Where was the burden born. I want to ask you three questions in our brief time together. I want to ask you question number one. What, 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 what interests you? What, what interests you? In your discretionary time, as you, you go through life and you have a moment here, you have a day here, you have a couple hours here, uh, let me hop on the internet, let me, let me search, uh, let me go to the library, let me go down the aisles. What, what interests you? I want you to see what interested Nehemiah in verse number two. Would you look at it? Nehemiah chapter one. Look at verse number two. Well, the Bible says that Hanani, one of my brethren, I think one of Nehemiah's physical brothers, Hanani, had gone on a survey trip to Jerusalem. Some of you have gone on survey trips. 
maybe gone off to the mission field and see some things that you did not see before and uh, experience some things that you would not have experienced had you not gone. That's what happened to Hananiah. Now Hananiah re re returns to Shushan the palace where Nehemiah lives during the Persian reign. Remember, uh, the people of God have already returned from captivity, but most people have stayed in the land of captivity. And uh, Babylon has uh, since been overtaken by Persia, and uh, Persia is the world-dominating power, and most Jews live in Persia. Now, is that, was, that, was that God's plan? No, not at all. God's plan was that everybody would go back and rebuild that temple, and everybody would go back and repopulate Jerusalem, and everybody would go back and, and get uh, back in line and, uh, with God's call and God's plan for his people. But most people didn't do that. Most people stayed in cushy, cozy, comfortable uh, Babylon and stayed in cushy, cozy, comfortable Persia. And Nehemiah has the, a great job. I mean, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. He eats what he wants. He wears what he wants. He is a man of high importance. I mean, Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is about to find out some things about his people, uh, things that uh, impact uh, his life in ways that he hadn't envisioned before. Because watch what happens in verse number two. That Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and, and, and I asked them, do you see the interest level of Nehemiah in verse 9, I asked them. I, I, I wanted to know. I want to know how my people are doing. Now, now wait a minute. Nehemiah's never been to Jerusalem. Nehemiah might have some pictures in his mind, but he, he has no, no physical pictures of Jerusalem. They, they don't exist. He, he might know his Bible, and I think he does. I, I think he's a godly man, but Nehemiah's never been there. He, he doesn't know what's going on. There's no real-time information. There's no way by which to uh, find out in real time the progress of uh, what's happening in Jerusalem. He's wholly reliant upon those that have gone and have come back. And th this interests him. And he asked them, verse number two, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped to which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. I wonder what, what interests me. Is there any interest in my heart for uh, the cause of God? Is there entry, any interest in my heart for the, the overall scope of what God's trying to accomplish in space and time in the 21st century? Is there, is there, any, is there a heartbeat in my life for, to want to be a part of what God is doing in the redemptive plan and reaching a world for Jesus Christ? Because that was God's plan. And God's plan in the Old Testament was that God would set his love upon a group of people called the Jews. And, and by setting his love upon the Jewish people uh, headquartered in Jerusalem, by, by setting his name there in Jerusalem, the plan was that, that God's people would be so effusive in their worship and service of God and so enraptured by and so captured by the, the love that their God had for them that they would be the, the, the poster child of God's love to a world. See, God's uh, plan was never to love Jerusalem. Jerusalem or Israel to the exclusion of the world. God's plan was to love the world through them. That was always God's plan. That God set his love upon them so that through them, the world would see the greatness of our God. Is anybody interested in that plan? See, that's where Nehemiah was. I want to know how is Jerusalem. I want to know how the walls doing. I want to know how are the people doing. Because by asking those questions, what Nehemiah was actually asking is, how fares the plan of God? I'm concerned about it. I want to know about it. Is there ever in my heart a rumbling of concern to say, Lord, why am I here? Lord, why do I live in Pensacola, Florida? Lord, why do I go to campus church? Lord, why do I have the job that I have? Lord, why have you strategically planted me in America? Oh God, what difference can my life make in the overall scope and plan of God for a world that he sent his son to die for? That's the point. The point is that this was an interest in the heart of Nehemiah. He wanted to know it was his heartbeat. You know, I think people come to those moments in their life when they realize what's really, really important. Too often we get lulled to sleep. I think about the story of Arthur Stace. You've probably heard the story. I, 
I've told it a ton of times. It's so capturing to me. Arthur was a, a young man born in Australia in 1885. Arthur had a horrible upbringing. His dad and mom both were alcoholics. By the time Arthur was a teenager, he was in trouble with the law, doing sordid things. Really, during all the 1920s in Australia, Arthur was none other than a, a street bum, a drunk. Somebody in the scenery of your life that you'd pass by and toss a coin to every now and then, that was Arthur Stace. But the amazing grace of God, the amazing gift of Christ, Arthur found his way into a church in the early 1930s. In 1932, Arthur Stace was saved after hearing a message from his pastor, Reverend Hammond, in Australia. Immediately, he had a desire to know God's word. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. He had no gifts, so to speak. But he was there when the doors were open. He was there with his Bible open. He was there with his eyes open, his ears open. He was there. Two years later, a man came to Australia from the United States, a man by the name of Evangelist Ridley. He came to that church and he preached a message from Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. He talked about the God that inhabits eternity. He talked about uh, the concept of eternity. And if we believers could just somehow grasp uh, the, the concept of eternity, it would change us. And in that message, uh, Ridley say, oh, that somebody, oh, that somebody would walk down the streets in the lanes of Sydney, Australia, and proclaim to people the God of eternity, eternity. And when Evangelist Ridley preached that message, Arthur Stay said it was as if the Lord were speaking directly to him. He said, I, I have my calling. I, I know what God's calling me to do. Now remember, he couldn't read or write. But by his own testimony after that message, he purchased some yellow chalk and he wrote the word eternity. You can actually look it up in perfect script, beautifully written. He said, I don't know how I learned how to write it. He tried to write other words and couldn't write them or couldn't spell them. But for some reason, God had given him the ability to write the word eternity. He'd get up at four o'clock in the morning, long before the workers would get up to travel to work. And he'd go out in the streets in the byways of Sydney, he began to write the word eternity in that perfect script. On doorsteps, on sidewalks, on buildings. People didn't know who was doing it. They would just wake up in the morning and see the word eternity and eternity and eternity. What's going on? Eternity. For 27 years, he basically kept himself a secret. Every day writing eternity, 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 all over the city of Australia. Eternity. Finally, somebody discovered, here's the guy that's doing it. They called him Mr. Eternity. He died in 1967, having written the word eternity one half million times. But the story doesn't end there. 33 years later, when all of us were facing a problem called Y2K, all eyes were upon Sydney, Australia. Why? Because Sydney, Australia is on the other side of the international date line. So uh, if there's going to be a computer glitch, we're going to see it there first. So all eyes were on Sydney, Australia. And Sydney, Australia is an iconic place. I wish you could go there. And every year at Sydney, they do a huge New Year's celebration. Countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the Harbor Bridge lights up. Now it's the year 2000. Now the world is watching. It's the change of a millennium. And what happens? The countdown ensues. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the bridge lights up. And you already know what the bridge says. In the perfect script of Arthur Stace, 
now gone for 33 years, eternity. Eternity. What am I saying? I'm saying, man, what interests us? What drives us? What's down deep in your heart? Only one life. And so soon it will pass and only what's done for Christ will last and last. And we're here and then we're gone. Our life is but a vapor. Hey, what's in you this morning? To say, I'm burdened for my generation. I'm burdened for my country. And I'm burdened for my world. And I'm burdened that people would understand who my God is. That they would get eternity. Where is that? What, what interests me? Let that be a barometer in your life this morning because sometimes we become too ensconced in our cushy, cozy, comfy life that we forget that God's put us here for a reason. The burden was born in Nehemiah chapter 1 as Nehemiah had an interest in, he had an interest in making a difference, an interest in the larger plan and scope of God for his life. But not only do I see that he had an interest. What interests you? But watch number two, if you would, verse number three. Verse number three, where the Bible says, and they said, so here's the answer of Hannah and I and the others that had taken the survey trip. And they said unto me that the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. Nehemiah, it's bad. Nehemiah, you want to really know how things are going? In Jerusalem, let me just say, it's bad. They're in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates thereof are, are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I, when I heard these words. Watch the response of Nehemiah in verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down. I, I sat, I wept. I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I asked you one question this morning. What, what interests you? What interests you? Can I ask you a second question this morning? What, what moves you? You say, well, you, you just asked that question, Kurt. What interests me? No, no. Uh, what, what we're interested in is uh, altogether different than what moves us. I'm afraid that, that we're really good in our Bible-believing churches at, at, at knowing things. We're good at Bible trivia. We're good at filling in the blanks. We've got the knowledge up here. I think we could even correctly say there, there is an interest level. I want to know the status of world evangelism, and, and I want to read the missionary letter, and, and I, I want to, yeah, I think there's an interest, but what moves me? I'm not talking about at the, at the, at the head level. What moves me at the heart level? And Nehemiah received this information from Hanani, and it moved him. How did it move him? I think, ironically, the first thing happened was it, it, it immobilized him. I know that's ironic. What moves you? He, he couldn't move. It immobilized him. He'd stopped dead in his tracks. He received this information. I can't talk. I can't eat. I can't move. I can't plan. I can't. All he can do is cry. All he can do is, was look to God and say, oh, God. What, what moves you? When's the last time you received some oh God information? That was Nehemiah. I remember being at a friend's house years ago. Christmas Day, actually. Christmas evening, 1997. 24 and a half years ago. I was with a bunch of friends. We were having a good time. I received a phone call from my brother, which was unusual. It was on a landline. How would I explain landline to a millennial? Um, just look it up. You'll see it. You'll find them in antique shops. They're in the history books. But it was on a landline. Kurt, you've got a phone call. So I grabbed it. Couldn't really hear, so I, I, I kind of stretched the cord around and got in the little side bathroom and shut the door. Guy can hear you now. What's up? What's up, Steve, my brother? I'll never forget the next two words he told me. As long as I live, I'll never forget them. He said, uh, Dad died. And that moved me in the way that I think that Nehemiah was moved. I didn't 
know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, I didn't have a plan. My dad left us when I was four. We saw him periodically, rarely, until I was like 10. I didn't see him at all for the next 15 years of my life. Didn't know if he were dead or alive. Reunited when I was about 25. Several years later, he called me with the bad news. I have pancreatic cancer. And now I receive the, the expected but shocking news. Dad died. I remember traveling down to Nanuet, New York that next day. I remember a blustery, cold New Year's Eve funeral in his Catholic church five days later. What moves you? Nehemiah received this information about a wall that was broken down, but it wasn't the wall that, that moved Nehemiah. He didn't have a, a special affinity for walls. He wasn't some kind of a, a, an engineer that just loved walls. No, he loved people. And a wall that's broken down can only mean one thing, that people are in peril. A wall that's broken down can only mean one thing, that, that God's plan is not moving forward the way it needs to move, move forward. Hey, Nehemiah had a burden. What moved him was hurting people and the reputation of Almighty God. That's what moved him. What moved Nehemiah was there are hurting people, people that I know and people that I love and people that are called of God and people that are just few and far between trying to make a difference. And the, the, the name of God is in reproach and the Samaritans and the surrounding nations are looking at our God as if he's just a, a low-level deity and God deserves more than that and the people of God deserve more than that. And I have a burden for God and I have a burden for hurting people. But it sounds like the heart of Jesus, doesn't it? It sounds like the heart of you. Lord, what, what's the great commandment and the law? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And what Jesus said, if you want to just kind of summarize the entire Bible and summarize the whole plan of God, just say this, love God and love people. And what, what this question, and what this interest level, what this burden reveals about Nehemiah is that Nehemiah had a heart for God and a heart for God's people. A heart for God, a heart for God's people. But it's so easy to get distracted. And stuff distracts us. Things distract us. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Jesus said a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. It's all about God and people and God and people. And Nehemiah saw it and it stopped him. Stopped him. Grieve, I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't move. Oh God, your name. Oh God, your people. Oh God. Do you find yourself moved for the plan and cause of God anymore? We're talking about something down deep. We're talking about something on the inside. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ capturing our heart and our lives. On a day like today, say, Lord, only one life. On a day like today to say, oh God, lift me up out of the, the mediocrity and the apathy that has so pervaded our churches and our nation. And oh God, may I see it differently. Oh God, may I be concerned about the Jerusalem that's broken down in my own heart. Oh God, may Christ beat in my life. That was Nehemiah. What interests you? What moves you? Question number three, what are you going to do about it? Well, what interests you? I think there's an academic side of it. Knowing the plan of God, knowing that God's put us here for a strategic person, but there's a, a bigger part of it. It's the heart part of it. What moves me at the heart level? I want the heartbeat of Jesus to be my heartbeat. Now, I want the heartbeat of God to be my heartbeat. Oh, God. But the, really, the big question is, what, what am I going to do about it? Because faith without works is dead. A man may say, you know, uh, I have faith, thou hast works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. At the end of the day, you know, what are we doing about it? Well, watch, what, and watch what Nehemiah did about it in closing. This is so convicting. Verse number five. 
And I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him. Observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, thine eyes open. O God, listen. O God, look, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned. O God, we're wrong. O God, we've sinned. O God, I'm sorry. You know what Nehemiah does? He owns it. Nehemiah wasn't their cause for them going to captivity years ago. Nehemiah wasn't even alive when they were given the opportunity to go back and rebuild the temple. But boy, when it all comes down the pike, Nehemiah said, oh God, I'm part of the problem. And I can talk about him and talk about them and I can talk about that, but oh God, all I can take care of is myself. Oh God, I'm sorry. Oh God, in so far that I'm part of this, forgive me, forgive us. Boy, we want healing in our lives and healing in our families and healing in our nation. And you know where it starts? It starts with us. It's the if my people. It starts with us. And what's all about? Oh, it's them. And it's the Republican. It's the Democrats. It's that church. It's that denomination. It's that, no, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. No, it's me, oh Lord. We've got to learn how to own it. Years ago, I was pastoring in Pennsylvania. And I said to our church family on a Sunday morning, I said, listen, you know, over the years, I've had some church members give me some problems. All of a sudden, all of those that were taking a Sunday morning nap in church kind of woke up. I said, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Some, some of you have given me some problems over the years. But I'm gonna, there's, there's one church member that has given me more problems than any other church member, and I'm sick of it. Now, I know I might sound like I'm in the flesh right now, but I'm sick of it. And tonight, in the evening message, I'm going to call him by name. You heard me tonight. That night, the church was packed. <laughs> Very soon into my message, I announced the name of the church member. And here it is. Kurt Skelly. And let me tell you who's given me more problems in years of measure than any other church member. I have. I'm my own worst enemy. Well, I know things about myself you don't know about me that if I told you, you wouldn't even like me. And that's true of you too. Man, we gotta own it. We gotta own it. We want revival, then own it. We want change, then own it. Let's quit playing our plastic, private, little, uh, 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 superficial lives, man. Let's own it. The world is dying and going to hell. God has a plan. Jerusalem is broken down and we're living our cushy, cozy, comfortable lives. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's the heart of Nehemiah. Own it. Number two, get a hold of God. I'm not going to take time to read the rest of the chapter, but I would encourage you to read it. You know what Nehemiah does? He owns it. He gets a hold of God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, I beseech you, oh God. This was no perfunctory, lay me down to sleep. This was no a perfunctory, God is good, God is great. No, this was, oh God, oh God. We need more, oh God, prayers. Oh God, your word said this. Oh God, we violated your word. Oh God, give me another chance. Oh God. Boy, own it. Get a hold of God. Come up with a plan. Own it. Get a hold of God. Come up with a plan. You say, oh, come on, Pastor Skelly, uh, you're the guest speaker today. Uh, give us a plan. Give me a plan for my family. Give me a plan for our church. Give me a plan for my workplace. Give me a plan for my life. Now that's your job. You got a Bible? You have the Holy Spirit? No, what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah got on his knees and said, oh God, it's our fault and I'm sorry and oh God, your word, we've ignored it and oh God, and guess what? Three months later, when the king said, uh, why are you so sad? He goes, let me tell you why. This, 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 and we can do this, 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 and this. You know what Nehemiah did? He came up with a plan. That's what we need to do. What's your plan for your kids? You're not gonna get different results doing the same things. What's your plan for this next year? 
when we watch some things evaporating right in front of us. When we see challenges in our society that we never thought we would see. What's our plan? What's our plan? Own it. Get a hold with God. Get a hold of God. Come up with a plan. My good friend Ken, business owner, self-made millionaire, very successful. Sold this company several years ago and decided to buy some new golf clubs. Went with his church on a brief missions trip to Nicaragua. When he was there, he saw the squalor, the poverty. He saw the gospel need. He went to the hospital in Nicaragua and he saw these parents that had brought their children to this children's hospital, but they themselves were sleeping on the street because there was no home for the parents. They would go in daily to try to care for their kids and feed them, no hospital food. The parents had to feed them, then they live on the street. He noticed this poor woman would come every day with her own money and with her own food and she would cook for all these parents. All by herself. She had nothing. But she would cook a big pot of uh, chicken, rice, and beans and feed these parents every day. And my friend Ken was just moved by that. So moved by. She has nothing, but she's doing everything she can. He went back to his hotel room that night and he began to pray like we pray. Lord, help those people. Lord, strengthen that woman. Oh, God supply their needs. Oh, God bless these people. And my friend Ken said that as he was praying, it was almost as if the Lord were speaking to him audibly and angrily saying, Ken, you help them. What do you mean help them? What do you think you're here for? What do you think I blessed you for? You help them. He said it was the most uncomfortable thing I'd ever heard from God. Well, he did. He went back to the States and began to cast the vision. He took millions of his own money, bought property, built a college, planted churches. Ten years later, there's 15 Bible-believing churches. Ten years later, there's a bunch of Bible college students down there being trained. Ten years later, uh, those people are being fed at that hospital. Ten years later. And by the way, the golf clubs are, st are still not being used. I'm not against golf. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, what's your bigger burden? Hey, come on. Right? Come on. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.